If we're not familiar with something, the natural response we have is to give it our best guess, like taking a test. Is it better to leave a question blank or to go for your best shot? And it's the way I think that the majority of Christians seem to live. They figure that being a Christian is to ask Jesus into their heart, be baptized, go to church, try to obey, but all of that falls short of the life that Jesus offers. Jesus didn't want us, doesn't want us, just to hang on until heaven comes. But Jesus wants to usher heaven into our lives today. During the third week of this series, uh, I taught that Jesus came so that you could live in a way that when someone asks you how you're doing, you could reply, I'm living the most complete, filled up, God-centered, peaceful, empowered life you could imagine. I think we all want to live that way. But Jesus said it in these exact words, John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. As most of you know, I love that verse. And that's why each week we've been trying to gain a fresh understanding about the nearness of God and how powerful a relationship we can have with Him right now. In week one, we talked about the desire that God has to be with us and that He promised He would be with us. In week two, we talked about the fact that it is our choice whether or not He will be close. He's ready, He's willing, He's able, but it's our choice. Week number three, we talked about the presence of God's Spirit living within us. In week four, we talked about how God whispers to us. I love that. That God comes to us in a whisper, in a quiet time. And He will if you'll allow Him. And then last week we talked about how God is reflected uh, in those people that are around us. Today we're going to conclude this series with the overall mission of Jesus. And that is to bring God's presence and to bring God's power into our lives. God wants this world transformed through Jesus, and it begins with us. He wants His kingdom to be active in this world today. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? Teach us to pray, they said. One of the things that Jesus said in that prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on this earth. In other words, Jesus says, God, make heaven come down here. This is where, this is how we should be. Your kingdom should be here and your will should be done on this earth. Now, what does Jesus mean? What is he talking about when he talks about the kingdom of heaven? My experience is that most of us are not real clear on that. What does he mean? Now, the in the, in the New Testament, during the mission of Jesus, during the ministry of Jesus, He talked about the fact that the kingdom of God was near. It was close. Uh, but after the resurrection, they didn't talk that way anymore. They didn't say the kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is near. Why? Because it was here. The church is God's kingdom of heaven. So that's what the church is. And what should the church be? What should we be like? Well, it should be God's kingdom on earth. We should operate as God's people. We should live as His kingdom on this earth. Now, I've got good news for you, and that is that the writers of the Bible, both Old and New Testament, had a lot to say about this. How should we live? How should it be with God's kingdom on this earth. What would it be like if God truly reigned on this earth? If God truly was in the heart reigning in every person, in every nation, in every place on this earth? What would it be like? You know, that is His desire. That's His plan. That's what He wants this earth to be like. He wants us to be like heaven. So that when we do leave this earth and go to heaven, it will, it will be just merely stepping over into the next world. 
There, as a matter of fact, there ought not to be much change in us when we arrive in heaven because we ought already should be living that way. So that's his desire. And if the, truly, if the church was truly the kingdom of heaven on this earth, what would it be like? Uh, the Bible talks about this in, in relative to the different spheres of human life. And the first one is this, the sphere of economics and human need. Revelation 7, 16 says, Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. Think of what that would look like if the kingdom of heaven was operating on this earth. No hunger, nobody looking for food, no pictures on your TV of children with swollen bellies. Everybody would have enough. There would be no scarcity. There would be no moms searching through dumpsters trying to find food for their children. It would all we would all have what we need. There'd be no need to feed, to feed children. There'd be no need for baskets of love because everybody would have what they need. There'd be no UNICEF. There'd be no food banks. But it would not just be the end of poverty. It would be an abundance. It's one thing just to say poverty's over, but there would be an abundance for everyone. Amos 9 verse 13 says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. Now remember when he wrote this, it was in Israel. It was a semi-desert uh, kind of area. Uh, and that's the context in which they heard this. We're not talking about rocky mountains dripping with wine. This is, this is symbolism telling us it is an image of abundance, of not only what you need, but even more, overflowing, as Jesus said, pressed down, shaken, everything that you need and more. Here's how you might uh, say this image today. Every day the stock market would be a little higher. The bull would dwell on Wall Street forever. The bear to visit no more. And never would interest rates be raised again. That's how it would be. That's the image. Children in Somalia would carpet their bedrooms. They would have private baths. The, uh, uh, everyone would own their own ATMs. The jobless rate would be zero. And even more than that, everybody would love their job. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we had that? kingdom of heaven on this earth. And then we look at the sphere of politics, which mostly is the story of human conflict. We talk about the Mideast, we talk about Africa, we talk about disputes that go on in our own country and around the world. That's the sphere of politics. It says in Isaiah 2 verse 4, He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. No more fighting, no more hatred, no more training for war. We wouldn't need it because the kingdom of heaven is on this earth. ICBM silos would be filled with water so they could train scuba divers. They wouldn't need those ICBMs. We wouldn't be worried about North Korea. We wouldn't be worried about all the things that are going on in this world if the kingdom of heaven were completely in power on this earth. And then the sphere of true beauty. John in the book of Revelation describes heaven as a place with streets of gold and gates of pearl. And you know, most people I guess get the idea that that is literal. But let me tell you, what John was doing when he wrote the book of Revelation was describing heaven to the best of his ability. The more, the, the more beautiful he could make it, the better it was. And so he said the streets were paved with gold and the gates were pearls, big, beautiful pearls. And he goes on and on with that description. But let me tell you, that doesn't even touch the hem of the garment as to what heaven 
truly looks like. Beauty, true beauty, uh, is a place where human hunger for beauty is completely satisfied. No more pollution, no more inner cities, no more ghettos, uh, but men and women created in the image of God blossom on this earth. That's what it would be like. They flourish in every day. We are a masterpiece of beauty before God because that's the way He created us. And the drawings that you put on your refrigerator that your little uh, boy or girl has drawn for you and you put them up there, you know, every one of them would look like Michelangelo or Van Gogh or Picasso. Probably more like Picasso. But uh, But all that beauty, that's true beauty. Teenage girls would look at a teen magazine, a beauty magazine, and look at, and then look in the mirror and say, well, I'm just right. I'm just right. Because you are in the eyes of God. No matter what you look like, in the eyes of God, you have true beauty. Uh, and so right now, today in your world, that's what you and I have. And then the sphere of security. In Revelation 21, 25, it says, On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Now, you have to remember, when this was written, they didn't have electricity. All they had for light was fire. They didn't have any kind of electricity. So nighttime meant the time of thievery. Nighttime meant that that's when the thieves were going to come. And so they would lock the gates uh, of the city and try to keep them out. They would, of course, lock up their homes and try to keep the thieves out. But he says, when the kingdom comes, there'll be no need to lock the gates anymore. There'll be no need to lock the the doors of your home. There'll be no gated communities. There'll be no security systems. You'll never again forget your combination because you won't need it. Uh, You'll not lose your keys. There won't be any keys. You don't need them. And the cops would pull you over to commend you for your wonderful driving. (laughs) There'd still be donut shops, but the donuts would be loaded with protein, and the South Beach diet would recommend that you eat all you can. (laughs) And then we have the sphere of family life. Luke 1.17 says, Turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. In other words, there'll be no more separation. There'll be no more divorce. There'll be nobody having an affair. There'll be no abuse. There'll be no neglect. And every child would be a child who is wanted desperately by his or her parents. None of those terrible things going on. Families would, spend, would sit up late at night trying to think of ways to serve one another. Brothers would insist that their little sisters get the bigger piece of cake at dessert time. The gossip rags that you see in the grocery stores. As you walk by, you would see the headline that says, My spouse secretly loves me twice as much as I thought he did. That's the kind of life when the kingdom comes. And then we have the sphere of God's presence. Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Think about those words. Would you want to live in a world like that? I do. Uh, There'll be no more... You see the little boxes of Kleenex in front of you? No more need for those because there's no tears. There's no crying. Uh, No funerals. All the caskets would be turned into toy chests. The hearses would be turned into SUVs with names like Eternal Voyager and Jeep Grand Resurrection. There will still be counselors, but you'll be so full of gratitude and joy that you'll just pay them to let you sit down and tell them how happy you are. And you'll love it when they listen. 
And every day, God will be with you. Every day, there will be no separation from God by sin. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. No more cold, stony hearts. No more stubborn hearts. Never will you say something that you later regret. Never will you do anything that you are ashamed of. You'll see somebody else be successful and it won't even occur to you to be envious. You'll just rejoice and laugh and get excited with them. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation will gather like brothers and sisters around the throne of God. And there'll be no doubts. There'll be no questions. There'll be no why. Because you will fully understand. I was talking to Linda this morning, and I said, you know, I'm not sure why you won't have those questions, but I'll tell you this, it's probably going to be because you figured out that was trivial anyway. And I didn't, I don't even want to know now, or you'll be so full of knowledge you won't need to ask questions. In, in any case, all you'll do is rejoice with God at what He has done over the centuries. Uh, you'll look and you'll see the face of God and He will be your God. And you will, uh, you will pray to Him. You will have conversation with Him. He will wipe your tears. And you will live with inexpressible joy. This is the kingdom of God. The trees will clap their hands. And all creation will shout for joy. Because the kingdom has come. There'll be no more curse on this planet. It's been under a curse for a long, long time. And it will not be that way anymore. That's what it would look like with the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And it's important that we understand it. And it's important that we want to see it. And you may ask yourself, you may ask me after this is over, is it possible? Is that real or is that just wishful thinking? Well, Jesus came with the message of the gospel, good news. And it was this in Mark 1, 14 and 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, near means now. He's here. It is possible. Jesus lived that way. And we can live that way as well. You can do this right now. You can follow Him, and you can learn how to live in the kingdom of God. Jesus cast a compelling vision. It, it was an ultimate message of good news. And people sacrificed everything for it. People lived for it. People died for it. And they did it laughing and weeping and dancing, unable to believe their good fortune in hearing the good news of God. The kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's open for all of us. And they laughed and they danced because through the life of Jesus and His teaching, He proved that it was near with the miracles that He did. And when He drove out demons, He was accused of being in league with the demons. And then He said in Matthew 12, 28, But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Folks, the kingdom of God has come upon you this day. And we can live that way in the kingdom. It's available for you. And it will come in its fullness. How? Well, people try to bring it about by human power. They have revolutions. Revolutions going on in many places in the world today. They try to bring it about through their governments. If we'll only get our guy elected, everything will be okay. But let me tell you, the kingdom of God is not coming on Air Force One. That's, that will never be the way. Never. Never. Too many times people want to tie up 
who you vote for in politics, in the church. And the church, what we need to look to is Jesus, not some man in Washington or, or St. Paul. But the kingdom of God comes with power from heaven, from God. And it starts with prayer. The kingdom of heaven is where people love and adore God and they are free from sin, and they pray to Him, Lord, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. If you want to experience closeness with God and the fullness that Jesus promised, pray, pray, pray. Pray for the kingdom to come. Pray for joy. Pray for peace. Pray for the kingdom to come right now in my life in this little part of the world. And don't glide over this prayer quickly. Settle in on it and pray and pray, <coughs> excuse me, for these things to come. The hardest Jesus prayer that Jesus ever prayed was, not my will, your will be done. And that's the prayer every one of us should have. Not my will, but your will be done. It's not just kingdom prayer, but we all need to be kingdom bearers. We need to make that choice to be with God, but even more than that, to take God to others. To let other people hear about this kingdom. Uh, pray to God, I'll be the person you want me to be. Would you change me? Would your will be done in my life? Instead of my own will. Folks, it's too easy to live with our own will. I want what I want. I want to have my things going on. And it's so hard to say to God, your will be done. And then you've got to be open to hearing what God's will is. Just as he said to Elijah. Remember that a couple of weeks ago? What are you doing here? What are you doing here? Are you just going to sit around? Are you just going to go to church? Or are you going to take the kingdom out to others? That's what God calls His kingdom bearers to do. <clears throat> we need to choose to know the fullness of the Spirit of God. We need to choose to hear the Word of God. We need to choose to respond to the Word of God and reveal God to other people and have up there come down here so that we might live with the kingdom. Now let me ask you this, what would it mean for the kingdom to come in your life? Let's get personal. What would, it, what would it mean to have the kingdom of God come in your life? Would you keep the job you have? Where would you work? Would you go somewhere else? Would you change that? Would you begin to sacrifice? Would you realize I'm in a wrong relationship and I need to get out. I need to stop that wrong relationship. Today is character time. And the closeness of God begins in your life with a whisper of conviction. To clear out the idols of your heart. To get the weeds in your heart out. And ask as you pray, your will be done. Ask God for His will to be done in your life. Ask God for His will to be done in your family. Ask God for His will to be done on your job. Ask God for His will to be done in your marriage and with your friends and in your career. Say to God, make me a kingdom servant. Oh, Father, make me an encourager. Make me a confronter. Make me a friend to others around me. Don't let your friends go to hell. Can I be any more blunt? Probably not. But that's what we need to feel. That's what we need to know. Are they really your friends? Are they really your loved ones? And if they don't know Jesus, that's what's going to happen. Let's be honest. And we can't let that happen. We must be kingdom bearers, taking the word to those around us. There's power in a prayer like that. No matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter how you failed, no matter how you stumbled in life, 
If you are in Christ, you are chosen. You are holy before Him. You are His chosen person. And God calls on you to be holy. On the cross, God whispered to the human race, I wish you belonged to me. It's your choice. Would you stand with me, please? And let's bow in prayer. <clears throat> Father, uh, I just pray right now that you would, uh, your kingdom would come, that it would come quickly, and that we would live uh, like kingdom bearers. Help us, Father, to uh, live in the kingdom uh, the way Jesus did. Help us to love others. Help us, Father, to uh, care about people around us. Help us, Father, to take the word to those who are lost and dying. And help us, Father, to show them the love that we have for them. Help us, Father, to make it real, to be really truly in our hearts and not just some religious exercise. I thank You, Father, for Jesus. Thank You for His life. Thank You for His teaching. Thank You for His sacrifice that we might live. We pray in His name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day today. <clears throat>